What's up, everyone? It's uh, me, your uh, host here, Ethan Levy. I am currently a gamer in residence with Connect Ventures, and I'm here with a very, very exciting interview today. Someone who had the bravery and courage to release a premium mobile game in 2022 and has found success with it. Something that most members of the Deconstructor of Fun audience I don't think would ever even consider a premium mobile game with no in-app purchases. Uh, but I'm very excited to have uh, up-and-coming game designer, game creator, Sophie Artemigi here. Hello, Sophie. Hi, thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. Um, so why don't we start? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into game development? Um, yeah. Um... A few years ago, I was actually training to be a translator from French into English. Um, I was doing that, but um, during my studies, I took a very short course in game narrative design, and I was like, oh, I could do this for the rest of my life, and so now I'm here. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're like, translation is horrible. This is it, great. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's fun. I felt like it was the only thing I was good at at the time. And it was nice kind of to have that validation of finding something that I was both interested in and I got, you know, positive feedback for. Um, yeah, so then I applied for a master's course at the National Film and Television School um, in England, uh, also known as the NFTS, which is quite funny because people get it mixed up with NFTs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, oh, you and... studied at NFTs, so you're a scam artist. Like yeah, you. yeah. <laughs> I, I studied scams for so long. My game is a scam. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's what I'm here to tell you today. Uh, no, um, yeah, I, I got a scholarship with BAFTA while I was there. And that kind of helped me a lot business-wise. And um, in my final year, I started development on Hookup, which is then sort of what launched me into this whole, like, business side of things straight out of it and so it's been really fun yeah so that's your game that you just launched a couple weeks ago right uh yeah i launched it uh june 7th i june think 7th. so it's been okay. a bit over a month bit over a month um before we get to hook up what what were your motivations for uh becoming a game developer uh what what did you find in yourself when you took that game narrative class that, that convinced you, like, this is what I have to do? Um, well, I felt really embarrassed about making creative things beforehand. In the mm. UK, you're not really encouraged to do that the same way that um, it seems that people are in the US. And so finally kind of... Oh, don't myself. worry. My parents discouraged me as well. So. <laughs> Oh, good to know. They still send me the odd law school catalog every now and then. And I'm like, I'm a 40-year-old man with a mortgage. I don't need to go to law school. And they're like, well, just in case, you know, as a backup. Um. Yeah. Um, yeah, my my family has very, like, you know, prestigious job backgrounds. So, like, mm -hmm. you know, accountants and lawyers and stuff like that. And so it was a bit of a shock for them. But... Right. Um, for me, it was kind of radical, like giving myself permission to do something creative. And then I kind of went a bit insane with it. I was like, I want to create games about nymphomaniacs on dating apps. And no one stopped me. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> right. No one was like, no, you can't do that because you can't. You know, I I mean, I'm going to I'll get back to this. But um, when I was younger, uh, when I was roughly your age, I think, was when I had the first idea, like, I was thinking about movies that were art versus movies that were entertainment and why video games weren't considered art. And, and the ideas that I had were not original at all, but I thought to myself, like, oh, um, if I think about some of my favorite movies, it's because the create that are, that are art and not pure popcorn, it's because the creators put themselves or part of themselves into the story and that's what we're connecting with in the audience and so uh i've never been a disaster bisexual on a dating app or any sort of bisexual or on any sort of dating app and i like your game let me experience some of those things um, in a really uh, first-person way. And I was like, she did it. She did the thing. And I, I mean, I don't know you that well. I don't know how much of you is in that story or not. But 
I loved that, um, you know, when I, the, the, the courses I took in school for game development, um, a lot of my fellow students were probably there. Like I want to make Grand Theft Auto. I want to make Call of Duty. For me, it was, I want to make Ratchet and Clank. And to hear for you, you're like, I want to tell stories and express myself through this medium. And that's such a different, um, I think it's amazing that you had that insight about yourself and that you decide to follow through in it and make this product now. Yeah. Well, it, because, um, the school I went to is primarily a film school. It just has a game design school. Mm -hmm. in it. Yeah. Uh, that was actually quite helpful because a lot of my friends are like screenwriters and mm -hmm. we used people who were like film trained sound designers and composers and, mm -hmm. um, it gave us a bit of an inferiority complex because nobody really considered us proper like screen artists, but it did kind of push me to prove myself in that space. And that sort of helped me grow um, in my own way as a game developer. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's why it's very, um, it's a very high concept game, but I, I don't think that's a bad thing. And I yeah. enjoyed making it and some people enjoyed playing it. So yeah. Yeah. Um, describe for us, hook up the game. Um, so Hookup is about a woman who matches with her high school bully on a dating app. You play as Alex, who's this 20 something who's going a bit crazy, um, uh, mostly in a fun way, sometimes not in a fun way. And you play by snooping through her dating app, swiping on potential matches, talking to people, including her former bully. And by having these conversations, you kind of figure out what's going on with her and what went down in the past between her and her bully at school. And um, yeah, it's out now on Google Play and um, the App Store. <laughs> yeah, I liked um, part of what was such a, a, a great design choice, I thought, was part of it is typing out messages to the different matches. And it's not just the bully. You there are, how, how many different people are there that you can have conversations with? There are 30 different people. Yeah. Um, we're going to do a PC release and add like a few more profiles. And so that should be fun. But yeah, overall there are 30. Got it. And, and one of my favorite parts is when you're tapping the inputs and it starts typing out a message and then it starts deleting a message. And uh, it'll be like, I, I can't remember exactly, so I'm going to get it wrong. But as a good example, as, a, as an example, it might be you're, you're, you've got someone you're like, you were so selfish, I never want to see you again, you fucking bastard. And then you tap some more, and then they delete it, and then the character writes a new message and then deletes it, and it made me... It was very immersive. Like, it felt very... Uh, I thought you did a really good job of matching the medium to the experience. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really like that mechanic as a storytelling thing, because you know that whatever they write, they think is the truth. Um, mm -hmm. whereas anything that you send to someone is kind of filtered by how you think they'll react to it. And so if you don't send it, then you realize that that filter is just not there. Yeah. Um, and I, I found that really fun to play around with and I used it on a few characters. Yeah. Um, what I, I'm not very big into the world of visual novels, but, uh, what visual novels inspired you to make hookup? Um, one that I did do know of and know, you know, it seemed like there's some kinship or inspiration with, uh, Nikki Case's coming out simulator, which was an IGF winner a long time ago. I... That again is a game that helped me understand someone's experience that wasn't my own. Uh, so I'm curious, what, what did you look to for inspiration for a uh, hookup? It's really interesting you mentioned that because I remember when it first came out, um, I played it because my friendship group found it on Tumblr. Mm -hmm. And I remember really liking it, but not relating to it that much um, because I've never not been out. But my boyfriend at the time who was in the closet was like really struggling it. And I remember that game really resonated with him. And so even though I didn't use it as like some of the original source texts that like helped inspire hookup. I like that game definitely had an impact on me and is definitely part of the journey that led me here. Um, I also am a huge fan of um, Tender Creature Comforts, which is a very similar game, except you're not necessarily playing as one person. You can 
say many different things, not just necessarily the thing a disaster bisexual would say. <laughs> um, and you go on dates with these people. That's I, such a I, great I, phrase, by the way. It's just comedic <laughs> when it comes out of your mouth. Like the rhythm of it is funny on its own. I, uh... all, di- all disaster bisexuals are funny. And so, you know, it's a very appropriate title. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I, I've, uh, I, I'm an old, uh, I've never done the Tinders, uh, or other similar dating apps. Uh, my only, my online dating life, I was ahead of my time. It was pre-app and it was, uh, very disastrous. Uh, I had, uh, three or four horrible J-dates and that was it. That was all oh, I could no. stomach. Um, can you... Tell me about some of the experience you've had that have inspired Hookup. Because I think Um, what's, just for the audience who hasn't played, what's, uh, again, a really great design choice is that you're playing the game on the phone and your your method is to interact with with dating apps, is how the story gets told. And so it's like a perfect uh, match. It wouldn't feel quite the same uh, on PC or on... Uh, with the controller. I mean, it'll still be good, but as, as a first uh, uh, approximation or a first interaction, it just feels really natural um, to be playing a dating app inspired game. It made me think like what other apps could be storytelling mediums. But anyways, um, so describe some of the experience that inspired this game. Um, I, well, that's <laughs> and I thing. don't. It doesn't have to be specific, like, I went out with Ben and he was a jerk, and now I put him in my game so I can shame him on Reddit. (laughs) Don't even get me started on Ben. Um, (laughs) um, Well, that's the thing, like, I've... You meet people on dating apps that you'd never meet just Mm -hmm. naturally, and so I've met, like, a physicist and a clinical psychologist and, like, a bunch of photographers and other stuff, and um, I... I don't know if this is strange, but I actually developed quite good friendships with the people I've um, ended up with on dating apps. And so a lot of them have played the game and have messaged me being like, is is this me? And 90% of them are wrong. They're just trying to flatter themselves. You're like, sorry, it's an amalgamation. It's an amalgamation. Yeah, totally. Creative license and all that, you know. Um, So I don't know. It's it's just a lot. The, The thing about the thing about online dating is that it's so inorganic and you have the potential for this like very unique closeness which is just like you know meeting somebody and becoming very like close and vulnerable with them very quickly but there's also this like possibility for this intense loneliness which is you know you're doing something that's ostensibly like very passionate and very vulnerable but it can feel so isolating at the same time And so a lot of the stories are kind of just things that made me think of that dichotomy, like things that let me play with that idea. And it's also annoying because, um, you know, the Google Play and App Store rules didn't let me talk about specific examples that would have been as shocking and funny as I would Mm. have liked to. But I think I managed to... (laughs) PC release? Maybe if you put in the Konami code, the, right. the real no, things I think, I wanted to see I think you should up. do a hookup X-rated edition. No joke. People I think that's, that. that's a really good marketing. And then you can just, instead of putting like graphic sex stuff, you can just put horribly uh, <laughs> true things. And that's what's X-rated about it. Uh, what are some of the things you had to take out? Or, oh, oh, like or, very specific kinks. There's mm-hmm. like, there are, I think there are two kinks that I kept in. Um, but the thing is, they they weren't that weird. There's, there are a lot of. Um, things, <laughs> You're like, well, they're on the king scale. They're like four out of ten. But Google, no way. Well, honestly, <laughs> like people, the great thing about dating apps is you can kind of just list things that you right. want, and people will be like, I can do that, uh, right. and vice versa. It's like shopping for sexual partners. Yeah, it's great. Um, oh God, I'm going to come off so badly on this, but um, <laughs> nonetheless, I'm sticking to my gun. Um, they, so you do end up experiencing a lot of very weird things, or like by weird I mean outside the norm. And I just know in my heart of hearts that some regulatory body would have stopped me if I started talking about urophilia or like... CNC or 
I'll have to look those up in a (laughs) private browser uh, after this is over. Am I allowed to look those up when six-year-olds are in the house? No. (laughs) God, I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. I mean, this is like, as I said, I think what's, uh, I mean, this is really what I was thinking. When I was a little gamer dork, the closest to this that even existed is Leisure Suit Larry. And, like, what a horrible embarrassment the idea of Leisure Suit Larry is, which was, like, this horrible text adventure, point-and-click adventure where you're a loser trying to get laid, and it's, like, the most juvenile 12-year-old, like, fantasy... But there's, like, 19 of them. I don't know. They're they're just... They're not... they're, They're garbage games. Sorry to whoever... (laughs) <laughs> Leisure Suit Larry. But, like, to be tackling uh, interpersonal relationships, kinks, dating, sex in a real adult way with a game, like, it is art. It's, uh, I, I think it's really cool. I'm, like, so glad that the medium has progressed this much that you could not only make this piece of art, you know, with, with some restrictions from the app stores, but get it out to people and that it, respond, you know, resonates with them. Yeah. Although, like that said, it, from a business point of view, it was incredibly risky. Like, right. you know, the restrictions that came along with it, the fact that I released it as a premium game, which I don't regret because 90% of the comments of, of people saying, please make it free, are like 13 year olds. And I'm like, please yeah. do not play this game. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a filter. If you don't have a credit card, you should not experience these. Uh... Yeah. But like, it's. Yeah, um, but part of the reason it could get made is that most of it was done off of student labor. And as a result of that, I have a 100% profit margin and, you know, some great yeah. data going forwards. But uh, nonetheless, it's, it's it was a huge gamble. And, yeah. you know, my my next game... I think I think I would make games like this in the future because I do have an audience and I do understand how and what I can do like in 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 terms of what is feasible but it I I I was very naive going into this and it it was like a huge learning curve as like a biz dev right you know yeah well as I said uh hook hook up triple x version on each <laughs> that's where it's that's i'd make so much money if i just started yeah. out the the temptation yeah. is real just to make x-rated games <laughs> um this game strikes me as very personal mm-hmm. um how much of it do you feel like the character is you versus inspired by you versus an amalgamation of you and your like how um is it is it a heightened version of yourself? Is it you and a lot of your peers experience or did you really like put yourself in the app? Um I don't know cuz Oh like Alex and I have very similar opinions on things. Alex is the mm-hmm. main character. Um but I'm not sure I could have written a convincing dating sim with somebody who had like a completely different worldview than me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I I had issues with being bullied when I was a kid, and I have had weird experiences on dating apps. But it's also, like, not just, you know, a, a self-insert. There, mm-hmm. there's, there's a lot of sort of patchworking of different personalities of different stories I've heard. There's a few stories that are somewhat stolen from my friends. Like it, the the story of Alex was more in service of like a larger um not to sound like, you know, pretentious, but of a larger like philosophical um point I wanted to make. And that is where you can kind of find me. Like that's, you know, mm-hmm. completely who I am and what I believe. But the characters themselves, I, like, I, you know, there are a few times in the game where Alex is an awful person, and I'd hate mm-hmm. people to think that, that those were things that I would do or say, but, I, you know, they're real. I mean, I think that's a, where a lot of, uh, I'm, I'm really into comedy, and I think that's where a lot of comedy comes from, is writers thinking, well, what if I took myself 
and took all the filters out and put myself in a heightened version of this scenario, like, mm-hmm. that would be, that would be funny. And it sounds kind of similar, like, you took, um... You took parts of yourself are in the character, but it being the character gives you the license for the character to act in ways you never would. Right? Yeah, I yeah, I I think that's a, a fair statement. I mean, also like the original premise, I just thought was very funny, and so yeah. the, there were a few things that were just in service of like a gag, and you know, yeah. fair enough if that's how you get there. Yeah, no, I think it's a, I think being matched with your childhood bully is a good hook. It's like instantly understandable. Absolutely. A, a few people have DM'd me being like, this is relatable. I matched with my childhood bully and I have never experienced that. That was wild for me that it could happen in real life. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, I, I'm glad I managed to do it justice to people who've actually been through the situation. Because <laughs> had I known that, like, people who had done that would play the game, I would have felt like a total fraud making it. Yeah. Um, you know, I've never... Uh, none of the game... Well, there's only one game I've worked on. I did, like, one narrative game as an indie many, maybe ten years ago that's personal or, in, you know, there's parts of me in the game. Uh, but, you know, when I'm working on something like Legendary Game of Heroes or Tetris or The Mystery of Shark Island or Poly Pride Pet Detective, uh, there's not a lot of room in those games for that type of uh, storytelling. Uh, I'm curious, was it was it scary to put so much of yourself or so much kind of real life into a game? Uh, it strikes me as being very opening yourself up a lot, being very vulnerable to make a game like this. Um, I practice this thing called like radical vulnerability in my like day to day life, and it's the idea that if you give people complete like context of what's going on in your life, even if it's like a bit embarrassing or you have to get a bit vulnerable for it, nine out of ten times people will try and help you, and so it's a good practice to have. And so I've had a lot of practice just being like you know oversharing too much with everyone all the time (laughs) and so as like an art piece it was more of the same but as a product like i didn't realize how much the mental of a mental shift was there because if someone's like this game is cringe i'm like oh well you know like other people like it but Mm -hmm. if a bunch of people like this game wasn't worth the 185 to that you know it took to buy it i that's different because it's like actually assigning a proper price to it and actually like assigning metrics and that had a very different like psychological impact on me Mm. um i would rather have someone like play it as like in a piece of art and say they hated it and thought that everyone was disgusting in it than have somebody be like i think it was 50 pence too expensive (laughs) yeah that's funny that's like, I'd rather you understood what I was trying to do and decide that you hate it and hate everyone in it and you only want to play nice things uh, instead of uh, saying this wasn't worth it. Well, I think it was worth it. And I encourage everyone in the audience to uh, skip a candy bar or <laughs> one quarter of one beer and buy yourself hook up the game and uh, expand your uh, mind a little bit. Thank you so much. I appreciate the plug. Yeah. What was what was the development process like? Uh, I know it was a student game or it started as a student game. Like, how long did you work on it? Were you working with other people? Did you have any services you paid for? Was it all solo development? Um, yeah. The Apart from, like, actual labor, the only cost was... Uh, eight pounds to buy the um, font making software. Mm. Um, oh, you made your own font. Yeah, we 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 did it because um, we wanted to be able to match it properly to the hand drawn aesthetic of everything. Mm. Um, we, yeah, uh, it was very very ugly when we originally made it, but we we put a lot of effort into it, and I like to think it paid off. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the master's project started officially in February of 2021. Um, mm-hmm. We made it. Uh, I had a sound designer, a composer, an animator, and a marketing person. So 
the sound designer did all of the like pops and pings you can hear and the dialogue editing and um, all everything that went in with the cinematics uh, the composer did the music that you can hear for the game and the, uh, we, we showcased it at a few conventions like EGX and we had um, a, a mini scene that we made for the game and the marketing person dealt with that um, because it was part of their course mm-hmm. uh, and then I did everything else oh and the animator did the cutscenes um, yeah and then um, but during the development period like a, a lot went wrong like I was um, hospitalized five times I had chemotherapy oh, which goodness. made me have to isolate for five months and then two weeks before the release I had two internal organs removed um, and so I, I like telling people that because I think that it, all of this is because I have this disability and I like to brag that it makes me a better game developer than the average person because no one else can go through that amount of catastrophe and make a sellable product in a year. But, <laughs> yeah, seriously, yeah. that's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry all that happened to you. And that's kind of amazing that through all that you have a completed product. Well, yeah, uh, like... I've, because it's because I'm disabled. Anyone who's listening, hire disabled people because like they know what's up. Like the pandemic, it's nothing to us. Just just another uh, quarantine, and yeah, yeah, it's um. Well, that's the thing. Like you know, I had to go through it, but you know, there wasn't really much of another option, and so I did go yeah. through it. And I think a lot of people can like experience, can like feel that with um, COVID, because we all had to kind of just really adapt to a new situation and we all managed to make some good games despite it and so you know you just you just keep on going on yeah um how are you doing now um good i've got some gnarly scars from from the surgery uh and you know i'm on a handful of meds every day but you know i'm i'm alive i'm breathing i'm working (laughs) on various games and so that's fun yeah that's a good uh, good attitude to have. Um, so it was largely yourself on and off uh, for a year, uh, working with a couple other specialists who are students, uh, beset by uh, personal health issues and setbacks along the way that caused work stoppages, I'm sure. Um, along... Uh, the way, did you look for publishing support for the game? I mean, I know we met because I was a judge for the big indie pitch from uh, Pocket Gamer, which Hookup won. I uh, was very happy to be uh, voting on that. But what was what was your experience like on the business side of things, taking this uh, 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 mature content visual novel premium mobile game uh, to, to different publishers or investors or business people uh, asking for funding or support? Um, yeah, well, we we got a lot of no's because it's a premium mobile game and it's 2022. Mm-hmm. Um, but that didn't really put me off. And we, we also got a few no's because, you know, of the other things to do with it, like um, the mature audience sort of risque nature of it and the fact that it can't be sold in certain countries with more, like, conservative... Uh, mm-hmm. laws around that stuff um, but we we did almost get published but it didn't end up working out in the end because uh, going with them would mean we'd have to miss a key window uh, in the app store uh, mm-hmm. because we got um, on the editors list uh, because oh, nice. we released in Pride Month and the game Got is it. very uh, unapologetically bisexual Yeah, and yeah so that that was good and I'm. It would have been a good learning experience to work with a publisher, but ultimately, I don't regret not working with one. Yeah, that's awesome that you got that um, that Pride Month placement. Um, that's probably as valuable <laughs> as any publishing you could get. I mean, I don't know. Um, what in in going through that process and getting a lot of rejections. As a developer, like what uh, feedback would you have for publishers at large? Like what were interactions you had 
um, that felt positive, that left you feeling like, oh, I want to email that person again for the next game versus ones where you're like, and, and I'm not talking, you know, don't, nothing, nothing specific, nothing like, uh, well, Ethan Publishing Co. was horrible <laughs> and fuck those guys. But just like, what are the things that on the developer end, you know, facing all these rejections where you're like, oh, this was, you know, I had a positive experience. I want to work with these people again or reach out to them again versus like, I'm taking them off my email list. They're, they're a waste of my time. Well, yeah, uh, to be honest, just receiving a rejection email that kind of specifically acknowledged you was very helpful. Um, right. I actually became really good friends with the CEO of a publishing company because they rejected me so nicely that I then emailed them a thank you for their rejection. And then right. we became friends after that, which was, you know, a very cute origin story. Um, so you make you you make friendships on dating apps. You make friendships when you get rejected by publishers. I think you're just a very uh, friendly person, good with uh, the electronic communication. I just you know why why wouldn't you want friends? Like, yeah, friends are just lovely lovely things to have. Ugh, friends um, are just obligations. If uh, Mishka Katkoff would stop DMing me on Slack, I'd get a lot more done. No. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, like the, if, if publishers, if all of the publishers were um, in front of me with their pens and notepads, like trying to take mm-hmm. notes, I just think it's like showing that you're specifically acknowledging the people. It's not just a blanket mm-hmm. letter. And yeah, um, a lot of them were like, I'm sorry, we can't give feedback because of the amount of um, pictures we yeah. get. And that's absolutely fine, just as long as it doesn't seem very, like, cold and robotic. That said, yeah. um, uh, one publisher I talked to actually likened publishing to a dating app, because if you're a guy on a dating app, you, like, have to message all of these women, and you'll rarely get a reply or a match, and it's just, like, mm-hmm. soul-destroying. Whereas if you're a woman, you have, like, your choice, and you can just sit back and let the best options come to you. And so being a developer and pitching to publishers is like being a guy on a dating app and you just have to be as charming and as like, you know, straightforward as possible in in hopes of starting a good relationship. And so maybe that's why I made so many friends with publishers uh, Mm -hmm. because of that mindset. Yeah. Um, Ultimately, the game was self-published. It sounds kind of, it was halfway between a... um, a choice and a necessity. It looks like, it sounds like you had that placement, um, that pride month promotion. And so you kind of were at a choice point. Do I want to go with the publishing or do I want to publish now and hit this promotion? Um, and I would expect that that pride month promotion was part of the uh, success story of uh, hookup. Yeah. Um, being number one on the app store, like even though it was for a few hours, it was insane, and that was definitely because of the you know promotion from Apple as well as like a bit from um, TikTok uh, that I was able to bring in. Um, yeah, well, I that's everyone... an amazing accomplishment. So <laughs> like, you are number one on the paid charts. Yeah, number one on the paid charts. Um, it's that's great. Yeah, take thank that, you. Papa's Pizzeria to go. Yeah. <laughs> Screw Papa's Pizzeria. People don't want pizza. They want horny bisexuals. Um, <laughs> I I actually, uh, based on some some preliminary searching I've I've done, people want horny bisexuals followed by pizza. Damn it! <laughs> Damn it! Uh... Can someone email Papa's Pizzeria and see if we, if we can get a collab going? <laughs> That's an idea right there. There's um there's a dating sim called Only Cans where it's like horny soda cans. Maybe uh-huh. maybe you could do like you know horny pizzas and uh, that could be an idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyone who feels free to collab on that idea, DM me. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Find um, your perfect slice. <laughs> Customized to your liking. Hey, All want some meat. Topping? Who likes? <laughs> Oh my god! Yeah. I uh, I have a joke that I would get canceled for. I'll tell you after Wonderful. this recording. 
That's a, that was a sign of emotional maturity that I did not say this horrible joke on on air. It's terrible. I would get canceled. I can't wait uh, for this joke. <laughs> I'm I'm just going to be refreshing our DMs after this. Um, <laughs> yeah. Where, um, where were we? Um, horny bisexuals on the apps. Horny, That's, right? Yeah, yes, yeah. you were number one. <laughs> You were, does that make you the number one bisexual or just the number one game developer? Um, I'm going to change my LinkedIn bio to both. Um, <laughs> can't wait for that. Oh, it's an oh honor. My God. <laughs> and, well, let me tell you, as a 40 year old cis white guy, seeing, getting a message from somebody on LinkedIn that said world's number one bisexual game developer, <laughs> I would be like... I have to block this now because I'm clearly about to get scammed. This is clearly a phishing scam. Well, yeah, yeah oh, but that's the thing. There, there are so many uh, bisexual game developers. I think I'd uh, instantly get nerfed by one of them. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, no. You know, maybe I'm that's actually that. something I've always liked about um, game development as opposed to like making accounting software or you know something more corporate or boring. Is I feel like. I mean, I'm I am a forty year old white guy, father, middle American. So I'm like, there's a lot of me that's normal, but I'm also a freak. Like I've always been a freak and a nerd, and like I feel like uh, in game development, I've found my people, and I've always been around people of all types. As a result, you know, yeah. I think it's a very or it can, parts of it. Parts of it are famously unwelcoming to anybody who's not. And I, uh, uh, I'm sorry to everybody who's gone through uh, those types of experiences. But I think as an industry, it's very welcoming to uh, very different type of people. Yeah, I, I would hope so. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's you... weird because I like I've experienced some like horrible sexism and like behavior I wouldn't wish on anyone else. But you're right. right like cause... some of the best people I've ever met are in this industry. And I, I, you know, I think we're currently experiencing growing pains where we know what yeah. we want to be. We know we want to be this inclusive, like open thing where, you know, people yeah. can express themselves and people can feel all of this empathy because of this great medium we work with. But yeah, there, there is still this kind of 13 year old boy <laughs> boobs yeah. type. There's a, yeah. When you grew up with Leisure Suit Larry, you know. I think you might be entitled to financial compensation from the devs of the suit, Larry. <laughs> I'm sure someone's um, going to demand compensation from me at some point, so, you know, might as well start ahead of the curve. Um, for... <laughs> Alright, so there was the Pride Month promotion. Um, what what have been... There were some confer uh, conventions you did. What, what have been your other marketing efforts as essentially a student project, solo, indie dev... With uh, not a you know not a giant bankroll behind you, how did you get the word out about a uh, hookup? We um, used TikTok a lot. Um, mm -hmm. We had like an official account at the beginning, but uh, then I decided just to use my personal TikTok to promote it, and that went down really well. Um, one of our videos has 1.7 million views. Um, yeah, I saw that. it was 1.8 when I checked it. Really? Yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> it's um. Yeah, and it's it's really funny. People really responded well to this series I did called Cool Features in My Game. And mm -hmm. uh, every single time it was just like an intro saying, Cool Features in My Game Part 1, 2, 3 or whatever. And then the feature would be like being a disaster bisexual, getting blocked, mm -hmm. um, you know, being... Yeah you know, sending sex or something like that. And it was always just like, oh, this is really depraved. And people really responded well to that, which, you know, is uh, nice. Um, yeah, I... TikTok is just absolutely insane the way it, its algorithm works. It's so powerful. And compared mm -hmm. to other social media, like, it really does convert into sales, um, you know, which is really cool, but also very overwhelming if you just yeah. join this to make a slutty game. And now... You have thirsty. Uh, I think I think thirsty is the word we're looking okay, for. Okay, thirsty. Sorry, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get you banned <laughs> off whatever platform you have. Sorry. Well, well just, if I have to be I, banned, so do you. 
Come on. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll all get. Well, I think thirsty. I don't know. You you're the young person. You can tell me if I'm wrong. Thirsty feels positive. Slutty feels like it has a lot of um, shame associated with it. Yeah, yeah. There's there's an argument for reclamation, but you're right. There mm. is that sort of shame uh, associated with sluttiness, but. I think hookups also a very shameful game. I think it encourages you to sit with a lot of shame, and I think that's right. a good thing, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. Sitting, sitting with your painful feelings and learning to experience them instead of drinking or taking drugs or extreme sports or buying things or whatever. I, I hear that it's very healthy and healing. I've never tried this myself, but I've been encouraged and told that feeling your feelings um, can be. A positive experience. I, of course, have no feelings, so I don't know what people are talking about. Oh, um, so you're a true gay of <laughs> that one. Nice. Right. Right. I practiced that laugh uh, for hours. <laughs> um, what's funny? What's funny about this is that the thing that got you um, that caused rejections from publishers. The thing that caused you to have to censor and edit your product to get onto the app stores to confirm with your guidelines, which is like um, talking openly about sexual experiences. This is part of what went viral on TikTok. Like it's content people want and have clearly responded to by the 1.8 million uh, views. So it's like being there on the edge uh, even though it was part of what caused rejections, also caused success and acceptance. Yeah, but like that's the thing. It's not even that edgy. Like it's about right. a conventionally attractive white woman who mm -hmm. just makes poor life choices. Like that. <laughs> that could describe so many games, film, TV. Right. Like that's the premise of all of Amy Schumer's sketch comedy. Basically. basically. <laughs> God. Um, and yeah, like that's. <laughs> It's, it's not that revolutionary and there were definitely right. still things we had to censor but yeah that like people can very much tell when something's being sanitized for the sake mm -hmm. of like that common denominator and i think that people could tell with hookup that we were like you know screw that we're, we're just going to try and make this we don't have anything to lose really and mm -hmm. uh, i'm really glad it resonated with people because it would have been quite embarrassing if i was like look at my edgy game and no one wanted to play right. it uh, you know, I think uh, putting putting art out into the world uh, that is is its own. You know, there's nothing to be embarrassed about with taking a taking a risk and uh, trying something, even if people don't find it. Well, yeah. Also, I mean, embarrassment's I good. You know, right. You know, like shame, it's good to feel it every yeah. once in a while. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um. So it's it's launched a month ago. Uh, we, we've covered that, that it topped the charts on the, uh, uh, iOS store number one paid for a couple hours, which again is an amazing achievement. Uh, I've worked on plenty of mobile apps. None have been number one on top paid. None of them number one on top downloaded Tetris might've made it into the top or de Tetris definitely made it into the top 50. Um, but never, that much um, for downloads. Um, what? How did the launch go um, for you? Oh my god! I know. I know thing. from the TikToks that the app that the App Store launch went well, and it looked like the uh, Android has been the disaster platform. Yeah. Yeah, so there was an issue where the game wouldn't download onto every Android user's phone, and that stayed up for a week. That entire huh. week, I thought I was having a heart attack. Like, right. we've bounced back since then. You know, it's not doing as well as Apple, but I never expected it to do as well as Apple. Yeah. Um, the game wouldn't download or it wouldn't open up? It would... It was It was weird. It basically... the It downloaded, like, an empty file for some reason. And Got it. So it's like one of those problems that you can't solve without someone's help at Google. And you're probably like using the portal and messaging and you're just like waiting and you're just one of one bazillion apps waiting for customer service that you're never going to get. Yeah. Well, we ended up getting um, we ended up just using a completely different build and like changing the keys and everything like that. But oh, my God, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, everyone says their launch is going to be a disaster. And I was like, that won't happen to me. And then it did. <laughs> and luckily, like, I know better now. I know what to look out for. Going forward, I would, like, I allocated one month to um, storefront and marketing uh, in my schedule. Mm-hmm. I would have allocated, I'm going to allocate minimum three next time. Like, it is, there is so much that can go wrong that you wouldn't think mm-hmm. of as a developer. Um, yeah, so it it was a disaster, but we, you know, we survived it somehow. Yeah. And um, how, what's the reaction been from the people who've discovered it on TikTok, who've bought it? You know, what's what's the uh, audience response been like? Um, yeah, it's, it's very mixed because TikTok, its main audience are like younger children. And so mm-hmm. you get all of these people who shouldn't be playing the game. Uh, mm. who have different expectations than older um, people, like people who are 17 plus. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's very frustrating because I, I I am very big on taking criticism and it frustrates me when I'm like, well, you're 12, your opinion's not valid. But it's true yeah. in this one your case. Your brain hasn't formed yet. I know, it's like, <laughs> what are you, 12? Oh yeah, they are 12. Um, <laughs> and so that was frustrating. <laughs> Because every every video I get, there are like, you know, a bunch of comments, like twenty comments, being like, "Make it free," you know, at least. Yeah. And I'm just like, I, you are twelve. If I make put it, it free, on, yeah, put it on Roblox. <laughs> oh, God. They can they can do they can match with one, and then they have to spend V bucks to unlock the rest. <laughs> this oh. is look. This is why you go to me. I the brilliant business mind that said put the dating game on. You know. They'll discover it. They'll spend their V. Oh yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I I think the market of selling semi pornographic material to twelve year olds has really been unexplored, and so mm. I I think no, I I think it's been thoroughly explored and found illegal. Oh um, no. Well, um, let's let's talk about that pizza dating game offline. Okay, pizza yeah, dating, yeah. pizza slice dating on Roblox with yeah. a lot of innuendo. We've Great. got a hit. Love Sophie. it. Fantastic. It. Out 2023. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, but it also the the thing about TikTok is that the algorithm no one understands it, and for good reason because right. if we did, like people would take advantage of it. Um, mm-hmm. But it has also found like a lot of people who are really passionate about the game and that's been very like heartening to see people being like mm-hmm. oh i'm non-monogamous and i really like this game um it was also really interesting to see people's um uh presumptions about it too because i would get all of these messages being like she better not fall in love with her bully and i'm like who said anything about love but right this what, what does love, love have to how do quaint this? yeah <laughs> right. that's cute yeah. Um, Love. That's for olds. Like <laughs> it's for the olds. Uh, yeah. They they put that in when they extract your wisdom teeth, right? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Mine haven't yeah. fully come through, so, you know. Um, how... So let me, let me ask you about this. Are you... Knowing that the game's promotion was like a Pride Month promotion... Mm-hmm. Uh, and that probably like the most likely time you're going to get promoted next would be part of another pride promotion Mm -hmm. for this game is my guess. Um, as a developer, are you glad that that sort of promotional spot and promotional content exists or does it feel marginalized like why can't this game be promoted through other venues why is it only under i i could see it both ways right like you know we don't we don't have white male game developer promotion month because i think all 11 uh, 11 or 12 months are are for promoting white straight male developers right but in it i think do you get my question right like does it feel uh are you is it positive tokenizing mix of both you know what what's your reaction when you think about that i mean i think the i i think it goes like a level up from that 
because even though games are something anyone can make and anyone can slap on whichever store as long as they you know pay the developer fee um if you want to get featured you have to appeal to like a group of five people from each store and they have their own like personal agenda as to what's go- what they're going yeah. to feature and you know it to to some degree you it has to be that way because otherwise people wouldn't get recommended games that they would like and there would be a lot of like spam or dodgy games if there weren't some sort of vetting process but it is kind of just playing into this larger game of how can I get this group of five or six people to notice yeah. me and want to talk about my game and for this game it had to be like within the context of pride um, yeah so that that that's kind of just how any storefront works i assume i don't know yeah. what it's like in the sort of you know crypto what <laughs> NFT. well there aren't there, there yeah I, I don't know yet either but um i mean i think uh you and i talked about uh, marketing a couple weeks or months ago and i mean part of me does think like the, the games i'm starting on now um because I'm, you know, starting in a brand new game company from the ground up. Day one, I'm thinking about marketability, right? Like my having got, having had the experiences I've had over the past twenty years, uh, I'm uh, I'm now coming at it where ten years ago I probably didn't think this way. Uh, actually, I know that when I when you know when I struck out on my own ten years ago, I didn't think about it this way, and now uh, here I am. And I'm like, okay, it's day one what is my marketing hook? Like, how can I prove that this hook does appeal to people? Who am I trying to appeal to? And I am going marketing first in a way. And that's partially because I have um, some confidence in my ability to make a fun game. So, you know, on your end, I wouldn't be, I think it would be a totally valid, uh, you know, coming off this experience, say like, okay, well, what's the game I can get ready and in front of people in time for Pride 2023, like how can I how can I dig into that uh, marketing advantage that I have that other people don't? You know, that's that's uh, uh, as a business person, I think that's a valid way to think about it. Yeah, well, um, I'm a queer, disabled, neurodivergent woman in games, right. so I've got like five months Bingo? I can fall back yeah. on. You know. <laughs> um, <laughs> You can be tokenized a lot of yeah, times. Like, yeah, like, I, you know, not to brag or anything, but I'm, like, pretty oppressed. Um, sorry. But, yeah, I, I agree with you. I do like to... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, um... <Pardon. laughs> it is important to make sure that your game can sell units, because, you know, yeah. at the end of the day, you need to... You need to be able to support yourself, and it needs to be a job rather than a hobby. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm I'm very confident in my ability to hold people's attention. I mean, you mentioned we met at the big indie pitch, which I won mm-hmm. that round of because I'm so confident that I can like charm people and persuade people and dazzle people, and you know, my next game I don't think is going well, to be the same as hookup but i think there are similar strategies i can take to market it mm-hmm. well yeah and don't don't uh it wasn't all personality i mean i think the judges were reacting primarily to the game and, and the state of it and the uniqueness of it um and so speaking of this game for you it's been a hit right how how's it performed business wise you know pretty good i spoke to a lot of premium game developers beforehand so i could get a realistic idea of how it worked i wrote up a proper business plan with you know an upper bound a you know a goal and a lower bound and because of the android uh disaster it's going to be like slightly less than um the middle bounds that we made for ourselves Mm -hmm. but it's enough to like if i if i just wanted for uh, the rest of my life to publish a visual novel every year. I I could do that and live comfortably, and I'm happy with that. Yeah, that's great. I mean, most people, most 
premium games or most games uh, with IAP or ad driven or anyway don't even uh, reach that success level of being able to support a developer. And I mean, on Deconstructor Fun, we obviously talk about the top grossing games and a lot of people who are on have worked or aspire to make games that are, you know, making tens, if not hundreds of millions a year uh, because they're big mass market games made by a lot of people with giant marketing budgets. But um, success is, you know, success is a bar you set for yourself. And it sounds like um, you have a game that that you've made mostly by yourself with low costs. You're young, although it does sound like the, the health, well, you're not in the U S so maybe healthcare. If you were here, you would definitely be financially destitute. Well, I, I am American. And the, the reason I lived in, you know, my father's homeland is because of my disability. But as you said, like success is sort of something you decide for yourself. And I would be very unsuccessful working at a bigger company because, you know, Mm -hmm. if, if you employed someone like me who then had to take off like random times for hospitalization and chemotherapy, that might be very frustrating to you and that might not be a situation that you could work through. It might, but it would be very hard because it was very hard for me and I was the one in charge. Um, and there, there have been a lot of jobs not in the games industry that I've worked that have been quite hostile towards that Mm -hmm. whereas being able to do it on my own and to accommodate for myself and to work around my own disability it's kind of created this virtuous cycle where i'm able to work to my fullest extent and i'm able to create a good game and therefore i'm able to you know make a proper living from it which is nice i'm um i we're i don't want to be too greedy with your time uh, but that does strike me as a really good point to dig in on. Um, what do you think have been some of the keys to keeping a positive mental out mindset and keeping, I mean, momentum, uh, keeping momentum in a project is something that every uh, create, every game developer struggles with. I don't, I don't know a single game that's been like, well, we started it and then we just worked eight hours a day every day for four weeks and everybody felt great the whole time and it was shipped. You know, like every everybody is struggling with that problem of momentum and progress and setbacks. And I think your um, story is more heightened um, because like my setbacks might be like, uh, my bills were high and I felt bad for a week and you're like, well, I had chemotherapy and I was out for, I was in quarantine for a month and I'm like, I need to turn my attitude around because <laughs> I'm a whiny white guy. Um, so, so what have been, what have been some of the keys, sorry, to staying positive and keeping the momentum up, uh, among, uh, these types of medical setbacks? Um, well, um, it, it's, sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to restart what I was going to say. Yeah. Basically, when you're ill, you have to let yourself experience the entire spectrum of human emotion. And that's the only way that you can be positive. Because I was so grumpy and like angry and sad and tearful, um, you know, during the weeks that I was having chemotherapy because it is not nice and it doesn't feel nice. But if you let yourself feel that, if you let yourself take the time off and then you uh, project manage appropriately, you can kind of get through it. Like everything's achievable and you come out feeling quite good about yourself because you've done this great thing. And so it's not about having this kind of toxic positivity. It's about being kind to yourself, letting yourself do what you need to do, and then just kind of getting up and going forward. Um, No game is more important than anyone's physical or mental health um and so if if you need to work you know eight hours a day while you're feeling depressed or while all this shit's happening just just cut features like screw the game it's not that important look after yourself that's that's my philosophy at least i understand that if i were making like a third person shooter slash fighter game there, it would be more obvious if I had left certain things out, but the player doesn't know what the completed game mm-hmm. looks like in your head. So, 
they yeah. don't need to know what you you didn't do because you weren't feeling well or you just wanted to play Super Mario Sunshine for two days straight. They right. don't know. You had to scope the ambitions of the game to your capabilities, your energy level, and your personal needs is what it sounds like. Yeah, the game is completely UI-based. I didn't have to do like any character animations, any mm-hmm. anything. All it was was a story that got delivered to you in a slightly clever way. And that was very achievable by one person. And, you know, it's a proper game. People accept it as yeah. a legitimate game, even though it took a lot less work than a lot of my peers' uh, games because they didn't have this constant fear of, you know, just falling ill every other week. Right. And and now you've you've had enough success you, with the game that you can support yourself while you make uh, game number two. So with this game, because I did it with student labor, I'm going to divide the profits with mm. them like properly because they invested their time into it. But um, game number two, I'll now have funds going forward that I can just pay people up front and it can just That's great. be the supporting cycle. Um, but, you know, if anyone wants to throw some money my way, DM me. I'm, <laughs> I'm always listening. Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, there's... There are some. There's uh, someone I want to uh, introduce you to after this. I'm actually not sure if I might have already. Um, but uh, wh- what? I'll, I'll I'll get to the wrap up um, so that uh, uh, I'm so not that you too can DM greedy. me about the joke that you made earlier in the podcast. <laughs> I'm not writing that down. That's Damn how it. bad it is. There can you will interpret be no... your dance it maybe? Yeah, I'll tell it to you, but uh, no written record. Okay. <laughs> What uh, what lessons did you learn from the launch of uh, Hookup that you're applying to game number two? Um, we already covered to spend a lot, book a lot more time for get storefront. Yeah, book, and getting it live. Book a promotion. lot more time for storefront. Understand that like the community um, management aspect of it is a lot more taxing and time can consuming that you give credit for shout out to all community managers um yeah they are amazing people and uh they have a very challenging job yeah (laughs) and um yeah i don't know i just i frankly i think the biggest takeaway are my new expectations and it's very unhelpful because everyone will tell you going into it being like it's way harder and way more complicated than you imagine and you think to yourself, that's not true. And then it happens to you mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, that is true. And then you get better for the next game. Right. And so it's not very helpful oh. for me to say, but it's true. And that's what I'm taking forward. Yeah. You're like, oh, that thing everybody warned me about. They were warning me for a reason. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any other creators uh, uh, who you'd like to highlight? Um, Any other visual novel creators or indie game creators that I should uh, look into instead of playing uh, Metal Gear Survivor? And what am I playing now? I'm playing Metal Gear Five, and I'm playing Vampire Survivors on the oh, Steam nice. Deck. Oh yeah. But uh, any anything more on? And I'm playing Hookup. I'm about halfway through. Uh, uh, other other games or creators you'd like to uh, recommend? Um, there's another game that I worked on that the demo is out for that is being released later this year called Zelige. It's by mm-hmm. uh, Louis Torres Talfer. And it's this awesome uh, game where you play as a medieval Islamic mosaic maker. And I'd highly recommend it. It's not as slutty as Hookup, I'm sorry to say. It's not as um, thirsty <laughs> as Hookup, I mean. Thirsty. <laughs> I wish it were, but you know that was his design choice. Um, yeah. And also, in terms of this carpet is amazing. <laughs> no. No. It's a lead to it's the carpets do yeah. match the drapes. Um, <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> I'll pitch that to him the second this call ends. Um, uh. Uh, yes, and also play tender creature comforts. I've mentioned it before, and I will mention it mm-hmm. until my dying breath. It's a great game. Um, All right. Yes, play it. And uh, where are you? It sounds like you've already started development on uh, the next game. Yes. Where uh, are you? Unannounced in that process? game. Um, we've got the game design document done. The 
story element of it mostly done and we're waiting for one or two things to fall in place before I can properly uh, announce it and I really wish I could. It's another sort of visual novel thing and I really think people will like it so that's all I can tell you for now. Great. And so if people are intrigued, they've obviously already gone to the App Store or the Play Store and bought Hook Up the Game, easily worth the $2. Um, where can they follow you? Where can they uh, follow along to, to hear when this next game is announced? Um, they can follow me at Sophie Artemigi. My last name is one of those difficult Italian-American names, um, A-R-T-E-M-I-G-I. Um, on pretty much all social media. Um, and yes, that, that's it. I'm not very creative with my usernames. It's just my name with an at at the beginning of it. All right. Well, Sophie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and for sharing uh, with us. Uh, congratulations on all the success you've had uh, with Hookup, and I look forward to uh, what comes next. Thank you. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for having me.